Again, we are moments away from Mal Moore, the athletic director at the University of Alabama, uh, introducing Nick Saban as the head coach for the University of Alabama for the first time. It's been a, a tough last seven weeks for the University of Alabama. Mike Shula fired just after Thanksgiving. There was a lot of controversy about how Mike Shula was let go and a lot of backlash in the public as well. He had a chance to address his team on a Sunday night, told his team he would be back with Alabama for this coming year. Then hours later, Mal Moore let Shula go, and a lot of people were upset with the way that went down, saying Shula didn't, give a fair, didn't get a fair shake and get a chance to tell his team in person that he was leaving the Crimson Tide. Since that situation, the last seven weeks, again, we were close to hearing Rich Rodriguez being then named the new coach at the University of Alabama. Steve Spurrier's name, of course, flew in and out. He got a new contract at South Carolina University. Finally, though, things quieted down over the Christmas break. The recruiting period was a dead time where college coaches could not go into the homes of recruits. And that seems to be when Alabama worked out this deal with Nick Saban. Again, his agent, Jimmy Sexton and Mal Moore have been in contact for the last several weeks. And there you see Mal Moore entering the building along with Nick Saban as he prepared to announce the new head coach at the University of Alabama. Again, this is a live look in Tuscaloosa right now at the Mal Moore Athletic Complex. Nick Saban sitting down for the first time. It looks like Mal Moore is about to introduce his new coach. I first wish to thank uh, our Chancellor, Dr. Patero, our President, Dr. Whit, and the Board of Trustees for their steady support and confidence throughout this process. It could not have been successful without their support. When we began the process of hiring the head coach for the University of Alabama, I stated the express goal was to hire a coach with championship credentials. While a number of outstanding individuals expressed interest in becoming the coach, of the Crimson Tide, one person who always stood out was Nick Saban, a man who has coached a team to the pinnacle of college football. His teams always play with confidence and pride. And I know in order to win a national championship, a team has to be mentally as well as physically tough. Coach Saban's teams have always possessed those qualities. Alabama has a long storied football history, complete with memorable moments and time honored players. Importantly, there have been legendary head coaches who, expi who inspired those players to achieve those moments in time. Today we move forward, uh, move toward a future with a new coach who will write his own chapter in Crimson Tide history. And there will be more of these moments that will never be forgotten. As an old football coach, I can tell you Nick Saban is a man who I've admired because of the way his teams play the game. He is a man filled with relentless energy to excel, and he exerts it in shaping his players into being better individuals as well as the best athletes they can be on the football field. This is a great moment for the University of Alabama. And before I introduce the coach, I would like to take just a moment and, and introduce his family. And, in, and certainly uh, in introducing Terry to say to you how important she was in the decision that was made by the coach. She loves college football and longed to be back in it. So does Coach Saban. But Terry Saban was the one that... Uh, made me feel good when I called her. <laughs> Terry, would you please stand? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, they have a son, Nick Jr., that is not here, is in college at this time. Their daughter, Kristen, who is a 10th grader. <laughs> and a friend of Kristen's, Nicole this in school with her in, in Florida. Welcome to the University of Alabama. <clears throat> and it, it gives me uh, uh, great pleasure to introduce the next coach of the Crimson Tide, Nick Saban. Thank you very much. I can't tell you how pleased and honored I am to be your coach at the University of Alabama. Uh, the spirit and enthusiasm that has been demonstrated to myself and my family has been 
uh, phenomenal uh, since we arrived here yesterday afternoon. It's certainly appreciated, uh, but I want you to know that it will be our goal to um, give you the kind of football program, the kind of football team that you can be proud of and that will complement the tradition uh, that this institution has uh, been so proud of through the years, and that's going to be our goal as a football program. I'd like to th thank Dr. Witt and Mao uh, for extending the wonderful opportunity uh, to my family to be your head coach at the University of Alabama. To the fans and supporters, the boosters, and everybody that's here um, that loves this program and loves Alabama football, uh, I want everybody to know that we need a lot of positive energy uh, for everybody to make a difference in how we go about what we try to do to have the best football team in the Southeastern Conference, the best football program in the Southeastern Conference. And I think everybody should take the attitude that we're working to be a champion, that we want to be a champion in everything that we do, every choice, every decision, everything that we do every day, we want to be a champion. Everyone take ownership for what they need to do relative to their role and whatever it is, whether it's being a fan, being a booster, be a good one. Any kind of supporter that you are for this team, everyone take ownership that we support each other so we can have the best possible football program uh, that Alabama's ever had. And there have been some great ones through the years. But the tradition here is phenomenal, and that's certainly a standard of excellence uh, that we want to work and make our football program a part of. Our mission statement here is to create an atmosphere and environment for everyone to be able to succeed, first of all, as a person. We want players to be more successful in life because they were involved in our program by the principles and values that we're able to uh, develop with them so that they can be successful relative to the character and attitude that they have as a football player here at this institution. The second thing is that we want them to be successful with students. Uh, I, I always tell players in recruiting, there's two things that we want you to do here. You got two careers, one on the field and one off the field. And the one on the field means you got to graduate from college and that's the one that's going to have the greatest impact on the quality of your life forever. So we want to have a great academic support program where we want our players to succeed as students. The third thing is we want to be the best possible football players that they can be. Whenever we got here to reach their full potential as a football player, play together as a team, and know how important it is to be a part of a successful team and fulfilling your role to that team. And the last thing is, is to use all the resources that this institution has to help everyone launch their career when they've represented this institution, when they lead this institution, that we help them launch their career so they can be most successful in life because of their association with this university and the people that have made this university great. So that's what we want to try to accomplish as the football coach here. Now, expectations. I know there's tremendous expectations here for what, you're, what you would like to accomplish with this football program. And I can tell you that however you feel about it, I have even higher expectations for what we want to accomplish. I want to win every game we play. I've never gone out to play a game. We've never gone out to play a game where we didn't want to win. And it wasn't important to win. And we didn't focus on winning and put all our energy into winning. But I think it's more important that you're able to take your expectations and bridge them into the process of what it takes to be successful. And I want to use this as an example. And we won a national championship at LSU in 2003. The players developed the goals for the team. And I thought it was interesting that that was the first team that I ever coached that didn't have a goal that was result-oriented, like go to a New Year's Day bowl game or win the SEC championship or some goal that was result-oriented. But this team, the five goals they had, had nothing to do with winning a game. Didn't say anything about results. The first one was, is be a team. Together, everybody can accomplish more. And when I speak to you as fans, boosters, people who love this program, you're a part of that team too. And together, we can accomplish more. It takes trust, respect for each other, and what everyone's role is and what they need to do. So that's the first thing that's important, is for us to work together and use all the resources we have to make this everything that it's capable of being. The second thing was, is work every day to dominate your opponent. And you know, we have an opponent in this state 
that we work every day, 365 days a year, all right, to dominate. But that's, that's our goal. That's what you get up every day to do, to dominate the people that you have to compete against and play against. Everyone needs to be responsible for their own self-determination. We don't want to point any fingers in any direction other than what we control, what we can do, and I, I would like for everybody that's associated with this team to do the same thing. Be responsible for what your role is and what you need to do. Be positive to affect the team and your teammates. This is a team's goal, but I'm trying to relate them a little bit to the whole big picture of what we're talking about here. Positively affect your teammates every day in the choices and decisions that you make. And then the last one was be a champion. Now this team did that, and they did what? Won the national championship, and I think that's the kind of process that I think you, you can expect from us in terms of how we approach what we do. I'm not going to talk about what we're going to accomplish. We're going to talk about how we're going to do it. Now, what kind of football team that we want to, do we want to have here? You know, we want to be a big, physical, aggressive football team that is relentless in the competitive spirit that we go out and play with week in and week out. And what I would like for every football team to do that we play is to sit there and say, I hate playing against these guys. I hate playing them. Their effort, their toughness, their relentless resiliency to go out every play and focus and play the next play and compete in a game for 60 minutes in the game, I can't handle. Can't handle. That's the kind of football team we want. Now, that takes a lot of conditioning. It takes a lot of preparation. And it takes a mindset that you're going to play for 60 minutes in the game regardless of what the scoreboard says. And you're going to compete that way throughout the game. You know, I've learned a lot about myself in the last two years. You know, I like the pro games. I like the pro players. Had some great relationships with the players that we had at the Miami Dolphins. Had a wonderful owner in Wayne Huizenga, who I truly respect and adore and love as a man as much as anybody except my own father that I've ever met in the world. He came and, and gave me that opportunity, came back on Christmas Eve and talked me into going to the Miami Dolphins when I was going to stay at LSU. And he is a wonderful person and very supportive. But what I realized in the last two years is that we love college coaching because of the ability that it gives you to affect people, young people, young people and their development and their character, their attitude as students, the importance of getting an education, the choices and decisions they make every day, seeing them develop the character, attitude, work ethic, perseverance, overcoming adversity, pride in performance, all the things that are important for them to become good football players, and also seeing them go out and being successful. You know, as I coached in the National Football League, almost every team we played had guys on it that played for us in college. We played New England, they'd have two or three guys, whether it's Jarvis Green or whatever, we played the Buffalo Bills. You know, they had three or four guys, uh, Josh Reed, Kyle Williams. I, but what the self-gratification that gave me is that I helped those guys fulfill their dreams when I was a college coach. And that was important to me. And that's why I wanted to come back to college. My heart's here. I love it here. Uh, I like to affect people, and that's why we're here. And this, obviously, is one of the best places in the country to have an opportunity to do that. Obviously, what we want to do right now is, first thing we need to do is hire a good staff. I think having good people is the most important thing you can do in having a successful program. There's a lot of good people here that we would like to, to get to know and we will have to hire a coaching staff. We'll interview the coaching staff that's here, see if there's anybody that we would, has the characteristics that we're looking for that would contribute to the kind of staff that we want to want to have. And the second order of business will be to try to pull together the recruiting class uh, in terms of where we are with the players that we're recruiting, those that are committed, uh, and any other players that aren't committed uh, that we might be able to get involved with in the very near future. So with that being said, any questions? Yes. 
Coach, uh, you talked a little bit about how you, uh, the the way you were received yesterday at the airport and here at the football complex. Have you ever experienced anything like that before? And did that solidify that you made the right choice? Well, it certainly was. Um, there was a lot of positive self gratification for me to know that the people here appreciated the fact that I was going to be the coach here. You know, when I went to LSU, I was at Michigan State. Nobody really knew much about me then. Um, and there was the equipment man, Jimmy over here, and me. That's it. That was the, that, that's who met the plane. So uh, there was a lot more enthusiasm and energy out there yesterday, and it was certainly welcome, and uh, we appreciate it. And I want the people that uh, came out there and do that to know that we appreciated it. There's a lot in the back. Coach, you talked a little bit about your staff. Uh, Melissa Lee, ABC 3340 from Birmingham. You talked a little bit about your staff. A lot of um, rumors, <laughs> even though you've been named the head coach, that, that rumor is done. Um, but some of the rumors out there are that Jimbo Fisher might return uh, and, and be, once again be on your staff. Will he be on your staff once again or possibly uh, Coach Trickett? Well, there's a lot of uh, coaches out there that have coached with me before that we would be interested in having on our staff here. Uh, that have a track record of being successful and whatever their responsibility has been. You know, Jimbo's certainly one of those guys, but I am not going to specifically comment because of the circumstances that they're in right now and their jobs that would jeopardize a protocol that we would need to go through professionally uh, to make it happen with any coach that we were interested in. Uh, so I, 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 I'm not going to make specific comments to individuals. When we hire somebody, we'll let you know. I mean, we'll announce it so you, you'll know first. Coach Saban, Kerry Clark, Commercial Dispatch. Could you go over quickly the type of offense you plan to run and the type of defense you plan to run here? Well, first of all, um, being a defensive guy, we've always run the same scheme on defense. I don't think that getting technically into it, anybody would um, um, understand. But uh, we play a 3-4 over and under, aggressive style, a uh, lot of pressure, a lot of, lot of blitzing. A lot of man-to-man -man coverage in the secondary, try to play close coverage. You know, when I went to LSU the, the, the first uh, time, they had a Bengal Bells group there, which was the women. It was the women's quarterback club. And the first time I went to address that group, they were asking questions like this, what kind of offense, what kind of defense, and all that. But the first question, there was a lady that was about 70 years old. She was about this high. She was all the way in the back of the room, reminded me of my grandmother, and... I'm thinking these ladies are going to ask me questions like, does anybody bake cookies for the guys on Thursday night before the game? And this little, this little lady gets up and she says, are we going to get up and play any close coverage on these people? Are we going to be off and let them catch the ball in front like I've been seeing around here for the last four years? <laughs> I said, we're in the right spot here now. We got, <laughs> we're getting coached up on the secondary. <laughs> so, but uh, that's the style we'd like to play on defense. Offensively, um, you know, we, we've always wanted to have balance in the offense. I think it's important to stop the run when you're playing defense, but I also think it's important to be able to run the football effectively, uh, dominate the line of scrimmage, but having balance and being able to make explosive plays. Passing efficiency, really important on third down. It's really important in making explosive plays. Explosive plays are important in scoring points. So those are all things that we want to try to create here in terms of the balance that we have on offense running and throwing the football. I also think it's very important that you use the players that you have. You utilize the players that you have. You know, I, I, I hate to start telling stories up here, but you know, you get me wound up. But you know, when I was in high school in West Virginia, we played uh, Mason Town Valley. I was a sophomore, 15 years old, played quarterback. And we're playing at Mason Town Valley. The school was here. You had to walk through the graveyard. The lights were bad. You get to the field. You go play. And we're both third and fifth in the, in the state. So whoever wins the game is getting in the playoffs. In those days, only the top two teams got in. So we get behind 18 nothing. walk through the graveyard, go in at halftime, come out through the graveyard. We get 18 to 12. We got a minute 27 to go in the game, and we get the ball back. And Coach Keener doesn't call any plays. I call every play. He made coach of the year eight years and I call every play as a 15-year-old high school kid. So we get down to fourth and 12 at the 25-yard line. One timeout left, take it, and everybody in the town where I grew up is at the game. Every guy, every person. The last guy turned the lights out. 
to go to the game. I'm saying, thank goodness Coach Keener is going to call this play because then I won't get blamed for calling the wrong play. So I say, Coach, what do you want to run here? He says, what do you think? And I said, I think you should call this one. It's the last play of the game. And he says, I tell you what. He said, you got a three-time All-State split end out there, and you got the left halfback's the fastest guy in the state. He says, I don't care what play you call, just make sure one of those two guys get the ball. So I called 26 crossfire pass, threw it to left halfback, faked to him, threw a post corner of the X, 25-yard touchdown, and we won the game, 19-18. But after the game, he told me this. He says, it really doesn't make any difference what plays you call sometimes. It's what players you have doing it. So I remember that. So on offense, I think sometimes that, that's important, and I think it's important to have playmakers and skilled players who can make a difference and make an explosive plays. Coach, Dave Cartoonin from 7 News in Miami. In the past, you've been quoted as saying, the best way to disrespect someone is to just walk away from them. By your own definition, do you feel like you disrespected the Dolphins organization or their fans, and is there anything you'd like to say to them? Well, I, I think that the two years I was in Miami that I affected the team in a positive way. I mean, we were a 4-12 and 12 team that was $17 million over the salary cap, and I think even though the misfortunes of this season, whether it's Ricky Williams' suspension, Dante Culpepper not being able to play because of uh, his knee injury, uh, Ronnie Brown getting hurt halfway through the season when he was starting to roll well, whatever those misfortunes were, we came up a little bit short in how many games that we won. All right, but I think the team is closer to being successful now and I think that the salary cap is in much better condition, and I think they have all their draft choices, so they're better off than they were now. Uh, my commitment to that organization, and it was premature, you know, to not stay there. All right? But if I knew, and Wayne and I talked about this, that my heart was to go back to college, and I think everybody should understand that I wasn't going to take this job. All right? And I called Wayne on December 23rd, when I went to the Miami Dolphins and said, I don't think I can do this, it's too emotional, I'm a college coach, I want to stay in college, and he came back on Christmas Eve the next morning and talked me into going. I, and I gave my best effort for two years to do that. And I think the organization and the team is better for that. And it was premature for me to leave, uh, but at the same time, if I knew that my heart was someplace else in terms of what I wanted to do, I don't think it would have been fair to the organization if I stayed. And that's what Wayne and I talked about. We communicated, and we both kind of agreed that that would be the best thing that we could do. Coach. Well, I want to hire the best staff that we possibly can, okay? And uh, we've already started, you know, to hire some people. Uh, we've got some other people coming in, but I don't think hiring a staff is something that you really put a timetable on. When you're trying to get the best people, uh, there's a process and a procedure that you have to go through, uh, and we're not going to take shortcuts to uh, hire somebody because once you get married to them, you know, you, they're, they're here. You know, you're with them. So I'd rather get the best people, do the due diligence that we have to do to get the best people, and then end up having the best quality of staff, recruiting staff, coaching staff, teaching staff that we possibly can. So we want to do it as quickly as possible, all right, but we also want to do it as efficiently and effectively as possible to get the best product. Coach Saban Cecil Hurt from the Tuscaloosa News. Uh, just as a follow-up, when did you initially become aware that, that there was an opportunity at Alabama, and what was your initial emotional reaction upon, upon hearing that? Well, obviously the timetable for me was um, there was interest. Uh, after Coach Shula was uh, dismissed, uh, I was in the season to, and said that I was not interested because my commitment and focus was to our team and our players to give them the best opportunity to win each week. And somebody else got hired, all right? And that was, that was fine. Um, and then for a long time, nothing happened. And the assumption was made that there was some interest on my part. But I stayed focused to our team all right, and what we needed to do each week to give our team the best chance to be successful. And I'm quite frankly proud uh, that our team beat New England uh, and played two really good football games against the Jets in Indianapolis, uh, even though we came up short during that time. And that was my focus, and that was the, the process that I went through. Not until after the Indianapolis game did Jimmy tell me that there was an opportunity here that 
uh, people were interested in me here specifically, all right, and that um, the possibility of me being the coach here did exist. Uh, and not until about 6 o'clock on Monday, uh, after the Indianapolis game, uh, did I decide to talk to Mal, talk to him on the phone. I never had a meeting with him, just talked to him on the phone. So uh, that's kind of the sequence of events for me. That's the timetable. Uh, Terry and I decided after talking to Mal that we would think about this. We thought about it for a day and uh, made a decision that uh, this is where our heart was and uh, this is what we wanted to do. And it's a great challenge, a great institution, and we're certainly happy to be here. Well, let me just say this. My next stop, you know where Lake Burton is? It's in North Georgia, right on the North Carolina border, Rabin County. All right, it's a lake. It's where they made deliverance, if you ever saw the movie. All right, that's where I go in the summertime. That's where I like it, and that's my next stop. All right, so as long as the people here are committed to trying to win, I'm going to want to be the coach here. And at some point in time, maybe somebody else can do it better. And if that time comes, that's where I'm going, Lake Burton. They don't have a football team there. We got a pontoon boat, though, a good one. <coughs> yes, coach Saban, uh, Kirk McMahon, Alabama Magazine. Do you, uh, did you have any conversations with any previous Alabama head coaches? And if so, uh, could you share any of that? Yes, um, I talked to uh, Gene Stallings. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Coach Stallings, who um, I know I've had a few stops along the way, but when I was a head coach at Michigan State, he spoke at our clinic. Um, I knew him when he was in the professional ranks as a secondary coach at Dallas, as well as a head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. Um, so then when I was at LSU, we had him speak at our clinic at LSU. So we had a history of talking ball, uh, being around each other. Um, when I got the Bear Bryant Award to be coach for Coach of the Year, uh, coach Stallings was there, uh, and we sat together with Kenny Stabler, and um, so we, you know, there was some storytelling going on in that bunch. Um, so I, I did think that um, after I talked to Mao on Monday or Tuesday, I don't know which day it was, uh, I did talk, talk to Coach St Stallings and just ask his opinion right, of what he thought about uh, this coaching opportunity. and. Uh, he was very candid. We had a great discussion. Uh, he obviously had a tremendous amount of success here and won the national, national championship. Um, and it was helpful to uh, myself and Terry in making this decision. Coach Tom Murphy, Mobile Press Register, right here. Um, you've had some heated battles against Alabama in your past at LSU. I recall the postgame 2002 in Baton Rouge. I'm wondering what your impressions were of Alabama when you were there and, and since then. How come you only bring up the game you won? <laughs> we, we won four. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, that it was a very good football team that Alabama had that, that year. And, um, you know, like always, you know, it's unfortunate when things get posted that aren't true. You know, I never said anything bad about the uh, University of Alabama after the Kentucky game and, uh, or anything like that, and that was the motivating factor for their team. I think they had a better team than us, and uh, they certainly played well that day and, and beat us, and I think Coach Fran is an outstanding coach and did a very good job here to win 10 games with that team. Um, but... You know, it's unfortunate that um, things that get, that are rumor and innuendo and maybe aren't true, once they get out, you can't control them, even if they aren't true, and it affects people's relationship. I think that's unfortunate. Nick, Josh Cooper, Decatur Daily. Um, what do you know about the team that you're about to start coaching the program, and are you going to be making any sort of changes to practices or... You know, just well, we have a way that we do things, and that's the way we'll do them. I mean, you know, I got the practice schedules that we use on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and that's the way we'll do it. Uh, it's worked in the past. We've been successful in the past. Uh, we have an off-season program. We have a strength and conditioning program. Uh, we're going to do things that we think we need to do to give the players the best opportunity to be successful. 
I have not been able to evaluate the team. I did not see this team play uh, in the bowl game. Uh, we were either practicing or playing someplace or whatever. I uh, have not had the opportunity since getting here yesterday to, to, to evaluate any of that. Um, but that's a part of the process. That's a part of what we need to do. Um, try to get the best 22 guys on the field. Uh, try to give everybody the best opportunity to compete for those positions. And regardless of what a guy's done here in the past, everybody's got a clean slate and they have an opportunity to, to you know, compete for their position. There'll be no depth chart. Everybody will have a chance. And, you know, but even when you don't have a depth chart, the first team guys always run out there so everybody knows who the best guys are. Coach Robert O'Shields from WAK, back here in the back. If I was a recruit uh, on the fence, right here, Coach, on the recruit, uh, you know, recruiting to buy Alabama or Auburn or somebody on the fence, what would you what would you do to woo me to stay here in Alabama for the next four years, and that you would be here? Well, I, I think that um, we have a pretty good track record of uh, recruiting, uh, and I think recruiting is all about attention and relationships with people. Uh, and developing trust and uh, you know Michigan State I think they were three and eight we ended up ten and two um, in the fifth year there uh, with the team that is the first team since 1965 that beat Ohio State Notre Dame Michigan and Penn State in the same year and beat Florida in the Citrus Bowl uh, you know LSU was three and eight when we went there um, in the second year we won the SEC championship uh, but in the fourth year uh, with the team of players that we had recruited, um, we won the national championship. And I think the players that you saw play last night for LSU were primarily players that were recruited when I was there. Whether it's Jamarcus Russell, Early Doucette, Craig Davis, Dwayne Bowe, uh, Laron Landry. I mean, they all were players that were recruited when uh, I was there. So um, I think that People need to understand that this is kind of the last stop for us. And I think that the University of Alabama has a lot of resources. And I'm going to go back to that mission statement and say that this program will help them develop best as people, best opportunity to get an education, best opportunity to play on a winning football team that will be a champion that will develop them to their full potential and also the best place for them to launch their career when they leave. And I think those things should be the reasons that they come to this institution. Uh, and we'll have good people here that can help them do that. Coach Tommy Dees, Tuscaloosa News. Uh, you mentioned Alabama's tradition and history. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to what you're trying to build? And, and what do you want your place to be in it when you're gone? Right. Well, I have a tremendous amount of respect for tradition. I have a tremendous amount of respect for all the people who created that tradition. All the players, all the coaches, whether it's Coach Bryant, all the people who worked hard to create that has created a legacy for the University of Alabama that's important, it needs to be respected, it needs to be recognized. But at the same time, we need to look forward all right, in terms of what we're going to accomplish here. Uh, because even though that says that all those things have been accomplished here and can be accomplished here, we need to go through what we need to do to accomplish them now and in the future in terms of uh, the kind of football players we're able to recruit here, the kind of things that we do to show a commitment to having a standard of excellence that's going to help people be champions. And I guess that's how I would look at it. I think it's what you do now. Well, it's obviously going to be as a college coach, and um, we've had success at several stops in college coaching. And I'm hoping that this one is more successful than any of those. And if that's the case, I think I'll remember, be remembered as a guy that uh, created a legacy of um, being a pretty good teacher, pretty good person, and a guy that affected a lot of people's lives in a positive way. And I think that's how I'd like to be remembered. Uh, Coach Paul Gass from Hustle Times. Uh, in your initial evaluation of the program and in your conversation with Coach Moore, what do you see as the uh, uh, the top challenge for you to not only give Alabama a winning record, but just to reach that championship level that you talked about? Well, first of all, you got to have good players. I mean, you got to recruit well, and we need to have a staff of people that are going to, I think we've made commitments here to show that 
Uh, there's facilities, there's things here, but the people, the relationships, the quality of football players that you can recruit uh, are what's going to help you be successful. The second part of that is developing the football players that you have. How do they improve while you're here? What kind of program do you have, whether it's strength, conditioning, uh, mental toughness, physical toughness, all the things that you need to do as a coach to develop a player to be the best that he can be. But the combination of those two things, quality of talent, as well as how you develop that talent, are probably going to be the critical factors that determine whether you're successful or unsuccessful, and that's what we'll focus on. And you know what? It really doesn't matter where we are right now. Wherever it is, that's where it is. It's where we take it to from there, how we improve the players that we have, how we affect them so that they have a better chance to be successful. And if we get the team to play to their full potential, then I think we've done our job. If that's not good enough, we need to get better players. Coach, uh, you have a reputation, a winner, teacher, demanding. Um, who influenced you to shape you in the way that you are as a coach and as a man? Well, I think, first of all, my dad was a coach. Um, he was a Pop Warner coach and American Legion baseball coach. And he didn't go to college, and he had a service station in West Virginia, and I worked for him for a dollar an hour for a lot of years. But um, he started out bought a school bus we had seven coal mining towns in the county and he would go in each coal mining town which was up a hollow somewhere um, pick the kids up take them to practice won 26 games in a row lost one won 33 more games in a row beat Joe Montana's team when he was in Western PA at Butler and all that stuff so he took these country kids that didn't have an opportunity to play taught them how to be successful how to compete and that certainly something that has stuck with me as a person and as a player. I played for him, and it made me better. The work ethic that he taught, the standard of excellence, um, the integrity that you do things with, uh, the attitude that you carry with you and the character that you carry with you and uh, what you do every day. Uh, and, you know, those kinds of values affected me. Don James was my college coach um, who at Kent State, and I guess he had as much of an impact on me as anyone in terms of, you know, organization, quality of work, being the best you can be. Um, and he's the person that got me in coaching. Most people say, when did you decide you wanted to be a coach? I never decided I wanted to be a coach. Never. To this day. Coach James, I was playing baseball. He got me off the baseball field and said, I want you to come and be a GA. So that's how it started. And being around him made me want to be a coach, and I enjoyed doing it because he was very well organized. Uh, George Perlis has, was an effect on me at Michigan State. Um, there's been a lot of guys that have positive, and Jerry Glanville. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, Jerry was a great coach, but, you know, I'm not going to leave any tickets for Elvis Presley anywhere. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, he, we left him for D.B. Cooper, who's the guy that was in the airplane in, in the northwest somewhere, jumped out with 250000 They never found him or the money. Well, we left tickets for him when we played Seattle, and there were four FBI agents at Will Call to see if anybody came pick him up. <laughs> Coach. I just think it's important that you comment before we leave today on our relationship with LSU and how you're taking this position uh, might affect us. Right. Well, you know, when I raised that crystal for the people of uh, Louisiana, for LSU, when we won the national championship, uh, it was raising it for everybody who contributed to supporting LSU, uh, to supporting that program, to supporting that team. Uh, and that was a special relationship. And I don't think there's any reason, because we're going to compete against each other, that that can't continue to be a special relationship that both sides respect. And that when we play and compete on the field, uh, it can be a tremendous, classy rival with as good a competition as anybody could ever have in a game. But what's special about what was accomplished together as that group should remain special just like any team that wins a championship. And those people in Louisiana were a part of that championship and a part of that team. And that special relationship shouldn't go away because we're going to have to compete against each other now. 
Coach, you've mentioned national championships a couple of times. What would it mean to you to have a statue on the Walk of Champions, and how soon can we expect it? <laughs> well, you're talking about expectations again, and, um, you know, I, I think that's probably one of the greatest accomplishments that we've had in coaching is, you know, winning a national championship. Uh, it was um, something that I'll never forget and something that I would most certainly like to accomplish again. Uh, and we're going to work very hard to do that, but we're going to stay focused on the process of what it takes to do it. Uh, and I can't make any predictions, nor will I uh, ever, about when something's going to happen. Uh, I just like to keep working on it, making it better, uh, making it better than everybody else has, then all of a sudden you have a chance to do that. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Here. Coach Moore will be available up here for a few minutes to take some questions. Also, John Parker Wilson, our quarterback, is also here. I'll bring him up here, sit him down, take some questions. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. You said for us to get off? Let's yeah. go on. <laughs> hey, Terry, it was a pleasure. All right, you've heard for about the last 45 minutes from Alabama's new head football coach, Nick Saban, taking Plenty of questions from the media, having some stories to tell as well. Now, Athletic Director Mal Moore is also there, and also Alabama starting quarterback John Parker Wilson. Two other people who might be fielding some questions in the near future. Our sports director, Jeff Shear, one of many people in the audience there. We're going to talk to Jeff in just a few minutes as well as soon as he gets outside the Mal Moore Activity Center there and kind of get Jeff's thoughts on how that first news conference went for Nick Saban as Alabama's head football coach. Touched on several things, uh, one of which many people are concerned about is the new coaching staff. It sounded like he already had some ideas on who might be part of that staff but didn't want to mention anybody's name publicly because they are still holding jobs, but he did mention that is one of his top priorities priorities right now to assemble that proper coaching staff and then get on the recruiting trail because again the recruiting uh, deadline right now is approaching quickly early February is when high school athletes do have to commit uh, one of the things he mentioned is a mission statement to create an atmosphere and environment to succeed as a person that is one of his main goals for his players to succeed both on and off the field he talked a lot about family and also about the expectations at the University of Alabama one of the many challenges that a coach coming into Alabama will face is the expectations and he said as big as those expectations are his expectations of himself are even more than that because he expects to win every game he plays as the head football coach at the University of Alabama. Again, uh, Nick Saban's wife jumping in there asking a question as well. Not something you see uh, too often at a news conference when a coach is being interviewed. But again, she wanted to reemphasize the importance of the relationship they still have with the people in Louisiana at LSU when they won the national championship back there in 2004. Again, uh, one of the main, main goals he has right now is to put together that staff. There are a lot of names being floated out there right now. The WSFA 12 Sports Department, Jeff Shear, Derek Steyer, John Heckman, they're out there gathering information right now to see which of those names might be logical fits, which of those names might be potential head coaches at the University of Alabama. So they're going to work on sorting that out. But it seemed to be that Nick Saban did want to get that staff put together as quickly as possible in the next couple of days to get going as you go out to recruits' homes. Of course, those recruits want to know who their coaches will be down the road. As far as the team that he wants to put on the field, he talked briefly about a 3-4 style defense, an aggressive defense uh, where defensive backs like to play man-to-man -man coverage and they get up and fly around. On the offense, he talked about the importance of being able to run the football and throw the football, but also cater to the best players you have out there on the field. Now, there was, of course, at least one reporter there from uh, Miami who uh, gave him a tough question, talked about leaving the Dolphins, maybe selling out and leaving them behind when he had not finished the job. But in the end, it seems like Nick Saban and his wife both agreed that the college football was where they wanted to be. He said they thought about it for about a day. Nick Saban talked about having a chance to talk with Gene Stallings, former Alabama head coach, uh, to, who led the Tide to the last national championship back in 1992. And again, after talking with Gene Stallings, he says it seems like the right fit for him. Now, our sports director, Jeff Shear, is live in Tuscaloosa as well. And Jeff, you had a chance to listen to about 45 minutes of Coach Nick Saban. How did he do? Well, Judd, in a word, it was impressive, very impressive. I was here when Mike Price was introduced about four years ago, and he was entertaining. I was When Mike Shula was introduced just a few weeks after that, Shula was uh, kind of a deer in the headlights, stunned, got up there on the podium, didn't really know what to say. Nick Saban, it was a 180, the complete opposite. He stepped up to the podium, he took charge. As you said, he gave his mission statement, what he wants to accomplish, his work ethic. He laid it all out there. He made his recruiting pitch, and... Uh, it's what Alabama people wanted in a head coach, and they've got it with, with Nick Saban. 
one thing that stood out, he said, people need to understand that this is the last stop for us. Saban has a bit of a track record as someone who doesn't stay, he's successful, but doesn't stay at any one place for very long. He indicated today that this will be his final stop. Of course, only time will tell. They have on the plaza here monuments for national championship coaches, for Coach Wade, Coach Thomas, Coach Bryant, and Coach Stallings. There's room for the next coach. Nick Saban was asked, hey, what about a statue for you? And he said, I'd rather work to get that happen. I will not make a prediction that that's going to happen, but I, instead I'll resolve every day to work hard so that that can happen. So a very impressive initial performance today for Nick Saban. Jeff, I thought it was interesting. Uh, not too many times you have a coach introduced at a news conference when the coach's wife grabs the microphone and asks a question. She really seemed like she really wanted to make a point known that they still have close ties to the LSU nation. And they're pretty proud of what happened back in 2004 there. I think that was something that definitely that Nick Saban and his wife Terry Saban wanted to communicate and when it was not asked during the press conference uh, we saw right there that uh, not only is Nick Saban hands-on but so is Terry Saban. She asked her husband to address his relationship with LSU and he said he wants it to be a special relationship that both sides respect. So yes, uh, interesting partnership and, and Mal Moore in his introduction of Nick Saban today mentioned Terry Saban and said that when I spoke with Terry, that's when I felt good that we had a chance to get Nick because she, like her husband, uh, enjoy everything that goes along with being a college head coach. All right, the wild reception is over. The first news conference is over. Now for Nick Saban, Jeff, what does he have to do in your eyes in the next uh, two weeks? Recruiting deadlines are coming up. He's got to get a coaching staff in place. Kind of give us your thoughts on what he must do in the next couple weeks to get things going. Well, you mentioned it right there. There are two things, two priorities on his agenda, and he's known for working 16, 17 hour days, getting a staff together and recruiting. Those are the two big ones. Alabama has several verbal commitments already. He'll, he'll get on those, firm those up, make sure that those players still want to come here. And as he mentioned today, he'll also see what players are not committed, see what talent he might be able, what homes he might be able to get into now. And at the same time, while he's recruiting, he'll also be assembling a coaching staff he would not confirm any hirings today, but there are a couple of former coaches he's worked with, Rick Trickett at LSU, Jimbo Fisher, the offensive coordinator. Certainly those guys will get long looks. He also, Saban also indicated that he would talk to the current assistant coaches and see if any of them would fit into his plan. So recruiting and coaching staff, those are jobs one and two. And Jeff, it's been a while since the Alabama fans have been able to kind of poke that chest out and brag a little bit about having something good go on. Obviously, five straight losses to Auburn, a loss in the bowl game this year, a losing record the coaching controversy. Can you give us an idea around town how folks are feeling right now? I imagine it has to be a huge relief to have this over. It is. Well, yesterday I was out at Tuscaloosa Regional Airport and it was like going to a football game. There was a parking uh, parking jam. People were walking in from a half a mile away and it was just an enormous, unbelievable reception for Nick Saban. Alabama people are hungry for a winner. They've been to the mountaintop before. They've been down for several years and they believe and they know that Nick Saban is the guy that can put him back up. I know you talked about those expectations and trying to be realistic. Jeff, I know uh, folks there in Tuscaloosa are hoping that he is the next coach to lead them to a national champion. I know you'll be busy the next couple days as the story continues to unfold. We will indeed, and if I were an Alabama fan, you can expect success right away. But really, if you look at Saban's track record, it's his third and fourth years when the players he has recruited are upperclassmen. That's when the magic has happened in the past for Nick Saban. Only time will tell if the magic will happen again from Tuscaloosa. All right, Jeff Shear reporting live in Tuscaloosa. Jeff, thank you for that report. I know you and the sports crew will be busy the next couple of days continuing to follow the story. So we'll see you back here at the station a little bit later on today. I know Jeff will have a lot more coming up for you today on WSFA 12 News at 5 and 6 o'clock. Again, Nick Saban, his first news conference as a head coach at the University of Alabama lasted about 45 minutes long. He's got a lot of work ahead of him, but it is a start at the University of Alabama. A new head football coach is now in place. And we'll have a lot more on this story coming up throughout the day right here on WSFA 12 News. Of course, don't forget to check out our website as well, WSFA.com. We're going to return you to regular programming. We'll have all of your day's news, sports, and weather coming up today on WSFA 12 News at noon. Thanks for being with us.